Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Today is March 2nd, and it is the Adult Cardiac Surgery Monthly Webinar. On the line with me today, I have uh, from STS, I have Sydney Clinton and Emily Conrad, along with Melinda. And then for my QVIA, we have Melanie, Joe, Michelle, and Steve. Leanne is off today, so she will not be joining us. And I apologize, I missed our last meeting. I was traveling, um, but I'm back. Okay, here we go. Uh, first, important update, important dates, updates, IQVIA updates, and then we're going to head right into education. Uh, Melinda is going to do some reviews for us, and then we'll have some case scenarios at the end, and then time for question and answer. So be sure to put everything into the chat box. Uh, I'm sorry, not chat box, ignore that. Put everything into the Q&A, and then we'll get to it following the presentations. Oops. So here are important dates if you wanted to take a, a screenshot of this. Today's the monthly webinar. Our user group call is on the 16th. Public reporting deadline is on April 1st. Get your consents in, or if you're not going, uh, we'll go over that in just a second, but April 1st is your deadline. <clears throat> April 6th is the monthly webinar. 20th is the user group call. I just went all the way out to the next harvest close. Our next harvest close is May 27th. That will be OR dates through March 31st, 2022. The opt out for that one will be um, on June 1st. Just a reminder for our upcoming harvest dates and what procedures are included in those harvest dates. The next one will be May 27th, it will be harvest two. Continue to still enter your data, get it in and get it cleaned up. Um, it's best if you can get it in uh, way ahead of time as much as possible with your follow-ups um, done or uh, if you need to go back just keep track to make sure you do enter those follow-ups and it will include procedures performed through March 31st 2022 and it's expected to be released in the summer of 2022. Um, and then uh, update on public reporting this was just sent out it was emailed to everybody you should have received it. If not, I just wanted to, if you didn't get a chance to check your emails, I just wanted to talk about this here um, quickly because there are deadlines associated with it and a couple updates. The adult cardiac public reporting refresh will occur in the summer of 2022. It's going to include data from Harvest One, the harvest that just closed, which will be OR dates from January 1st, 2019 through December 31st. As a note, the cabbage composite, um, as you know, it, it changed from the one-year cabbage composite to a three-year cabbage composite. Sites will automatically be enrolled. If you had already consented to public reporting, your site will automatically be enrolled to report out that three-year cabbage composite. So you do not need to take any actions if you wanna continue publicly reporting out that data. If you choose to opt out of, uh, of that automatic rollover, you must do so by April 1st. There's links within the email that was sent uh, to, perform, to perform those. Um, the, um, other, the other comment that I wanted to make is that if you are um, new to public reporting or you want it to change what you're publicly reporting, you must get your consents in by Friday, April 1st. Any questions can be sent to Sydney Clinton at sclinton at sts.org. Please be sure to include your PID and your emails to Sydney so she's able to easily access your site without having to go back and forth with uh, emails. So again, you're automatically enrolled in the three-year cabbage composite if you have already previously consented to report your current one-year cabbage composite. Um, if you choose to opt out of that, make sure you do so by April 1st. And if you'd like to be a new public reporting uh, site, you must do so also by, public, by April 1st. Harvest 4 data is back from IQVIA. IQVIA, I'm sorry, is back from DCRI. It's back from analysis at DCRI. IQVIA is preparing for release on March 12th. So those reports are expected to be released to you on March 12th. Uh, March training manual is posted. Melinda did a great job getting it out uh, ahead of time at the beginning of the month for everybody. And now I'm going to hand it over to Joe for the IQV updates. Joe. Thank you, Carol. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, and not a lot of new information here, but just to recap um, a couple items that we've brought up previously. Um, also, just an update that these items are coming to you this coming weekend, um, March 5th. Uh, so in regard to the risk adjusted dashboard report, the analyzed report, a couple updates for printing and exporting, SCS 7715. Uh, the export button that exports your full report to a PDF is currently including the anesthesia section for those sites who are not enrolled in that component. Uh, so we will be updating that so that no longer occurs. And then SCS 6706, uh, the risk adjusted report is cutting off the label descriptions when exported to PDF. And so we'll be updating that as well. Uh, some calculation updates, uh, SCS 7188. We did receive reports of a discrepancy in the denominator for the yes and among eligible cases sections of the benchmark report for beta blockers. Uh, we identified the cause of that issue and the fix will be coming um, this weekend. Uh, SCS 7812, the current benchmark reports for operative and post-operative events are not correctly including the version 4.20.2 variable for intra-op blood products platelet dose pack for the one plus platelet units result. Uh, so that will be corrected. And then STS uh, 6867, we did get reports from some sites that they were seeing incorrect values for missing and yes for the IABP used, radial arteries used, and cardiac referral sections on the benchmark reports. Uh, so that will be updated as well. Uh, some additional uh, calculation updates, uh, STS 7649. Um, also looking at the IABP field, uh, an update will be made to properly include the parent field logic for the MAC vent assist device variable for version 4.20.2. Uh, STS 6928, uh, we are looking into reports that the conduit harvest or cannulation site line on the morbidity mortality benchmark report is not displaying as corrected, uh, as expected, uh, which will be corrected. Uh, um, sorry, Joe. Yep. We were, we were on the wrong slide. Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. All right. There we go. Carol, we're we're good now. I'm sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, SCS 7648. The missing line for intra-op blood products used currently does not include the parent field logic for intra-op blood products refused. Uh, so that will be updated. So that gets uh, included. And then SCS 7089. Um, on the anesthesia benchmark reports, we did identify an issue with the results for retrograde autologous pr priming of the CPB circuit line, uh, and that will be updated this weekend. And then uh, one update for the participant, the non-analyzed dashboard report. Uh, we, uh, there is an update required for the post-operative events rhythm disturbance requiring permanent device to include the new rhythm dis variable from version 4.2. 2.0.2. Uh, so you'll see that update coming uh, after this weekend as well. And just a note here that um, for everything I've mentioned today, uh, there's no changes required from you. There's no action required from you to do anything. Uh, once this update goes through for these fixes, uh, those will be applied automatically and you will see the corrected information um, after that update goes through. Thanks, Joe. Right. No problem. Just the usual uh, recommendations. We will be posting a updated list of known issues to the library uh, for reference this week. Um, and then um, feel free to follow up with us for any tickets you may have. Uh, and we will um, see if there are updates for you if you haven't heard anything or if you're looking for more information. Great. And make sure that if you have a ticket number to include that in your email communication, please. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then just our IQVIA support plan. Um, okay, before we go to education, Melinda, I just want to, um, I know that we're going to get some questions on your education, so I just want to handle the questions that are in the chat box uh, first, if that's okay. Uh, question right. for the um, harvest schedule, here it is. And then there was another question regarding the harvest four report that will be released on March 12th, that's up uh, to be released on March 12th. Um, okay. All right. I guess we're going to, I'm going to move on now. We'll hand it over to you, Melinda. I just wanted to get those out of the way. So I did. Oh, and one more from Dave. He asked about an update on any potential upgrades for the adult cardiac. Usually we upgrade the database every three years. So we would have been due for an upgrade 
uh, to go live January 1st, 2023. However, uh, the STS surge and leadership decided that we are holding off on upgrades at this time um, because the 4.2 upgrade was a fairly successful one. Um, we didn't, they didn't feel the need to go through that whole process again and change things. So we're gonna hold off for right now and I do not have a date for the next upgrade, but when I get more information or if I, when I get, get uh, intel on that, I'll be sure to share it with you. Okay, now you can go Melinda. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna share my screen to the training manual first. Um, so let me pull that up. Hi everybody. Can you see my my training manual on the yes, screen? Yes, mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to do a brief like overview of how to use the training manual um, because I think there's some um, little tricks in here that some people may not be familiar with. Um, so, as you notice, all of these things in blue, like adult cardiac homepage, if you click on that, it'll take you to the homepage or ask a question, it'll take you to the link or data manual education, it'll take you to the link. The other interesting thing is over on the side here, it says contents. And if you click on that, it opens up a table of contents, which has been bookmarked. So like if I wanted to go to the hemodynamics cath section, I could just click on that bookmark and it would take me right there. And then you can see right below that is your source uh, document for coding, for priority coding. Um, if I wanted to go to, oh, let's say I wanted to go to the operative section, I could just click on that. Or, oh, I need some information about the cannulation site click there. So there's a lot of little bookmarks over here that'll kind of help you um, quickly navigate through um, the training manual. I use it a lot. Um, the other thing that I use probably almost every time I answer an FAQ question is the search function. So there's, you just click on that little um, microscope glass up there. And let's say that I'm, I have a question about sequence 5450. And I just type it in and it will take me to all the references for that question. So you can see this is in sequence 5442, but it pertains, it's got some uh, information about 5450 here, but I can just kind of click through here and I'm gonna get every mention of that sequence number in this entire training lead. Um or let's say you don't know the sequence number, but you, you're looking for like subaortic stenosis. So you can just um, type in the word. Oh, and looky there, it's gonna take you to all the mentions of subaortic stenosis. This I find is very helpful, very easy to use, very user-friendly, and it makes getting through the training manual um, quite easy because it is a long training manual and um, or if you had a question about COVID just type that in hit enter and it's going to take you to all the mentions of COVID in the entire training manual and you can just kind of click through and find what you're looking for um, I do this a lot the other thing in the bookmarks that I forgot to mention over here in the table of contents is all of the updates are bookmarked too. So like I can go right there and it's gonna show me uh, the new stuff that was put in the training manual. So I can just quickly um, reference those. Um, so I, that's all I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you this because I think sometimes I didn't know this for a long time. And um, I suspect there are other people out there like me who, who don't know that this even exists in the training manual, these great resources. Oh, the other thing, one other thing. So I want to show you. Uh, so let's go back to the hemodynamics section. Um, and let's say you're down here. Actually, I want to go down here a little further. Let's say you're in, in the... Um, EF section. And you see that this please refer to the general statement for the time frame. If you just click on that, 
it should take you right back to where you need to be so you can see your source document for priority coding. Um, in case you remember which order you're supposed to collect data in, that's kind of a useful thing to know. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead now. We're going to talk about a few. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'll let Carol share her screen again with the slides. And we're going to talk a little bit about a few um, training manual updates that just came out. So I had um, a question came in the box from Dave uh, last month. And he wanted me to provide some clarity on planned versus unplanned for sequences 2120 through 2140. And I actually, quite honestly, it was, it's a great, it was a great thing that needed to be done. Um, I just, I just never had, I just hadn't thought about it, hadn't done it, didn't realize it needed clarification. So thanks Dave for that. So I've put out some new language in the training manual. So let's talk about this a little bit. So these are 2120 through 2140. So these are your index procedures, whether they're planned or they're unplanned due to um, <clears throat> new anatomy or unplanned due to complication. So let's talk about yes plan first. So these are procedures done in the OR that were planned to be performed prior to OR entry. So for example, your op consent says cabbage with possible AVR. So both of these procedures were planned to be done. Um, or if a, a progress note, sometimes you can look at your consent. You can also see the intent in the surgical consult note. Yes, I plan to go in there and do a cabbage and I might do an AVR <clears throat> if, I, if needed because right now it looks like he's got some moderate insufficiency, but we'll see what it is when I get there or something like that. So plan procedures are things that are known prior to going into the OR. Plan procedures can also be like aortic dissections, even though they're emergent procedures, they can be planned. Um, the patient has a dissection, the surgeon is planning to go to the OR to fix the dissection. Okay. All right. So that's that one concept. Then we'll go to the next concept is um, yes, unplanned due to unsuspected disease or anatomy. So these are new um, disease findings found in the OR that require an operative procedure to repair. So for example, you get into the operating room and you find severe mitral regurgitation discovered on the um, intra-op TEE and you do an MVR. Well, that is, that's unsuspected disease or anatomy. The surgeon did not realize what, that when he was going to the OR, he was going to perform an MVR. And it's not a complication because they found this on the intra-op TEE prior to the procedure and there was no complication that caused this severe MR. It was just there, it's a new disease finding. Much like another example is if they find a tumor, they go in and they, oh, wow, I didn't know we had this tumor. This is a new anatomy, new disease, so they're gonna fix it. That's planned, unplanned due to unsuspected disease or anatomy. And then the last category, I call the oops category. So these are people that um, have procedures due to surgical complications. So these are unplanned, they're due to a complication. Now a surgical complication can be anything that happens in the surgery. So, you know, anesthesia could put um, a swan in and cause a pulmonary artery injury and that has to be fixed. That's a surgical complication or the surgeon could accidentally nick the left ventricle and, oh, I got to fix that. That's a surgical complication. So these are injuries that occur in this time of surgery that need to be repaired. So these are unplanned due to surgical complication. So now we have some scenarios to go over just to make sure that everybody understands this. So during a mitral valve replacement, a right atrium repair was done. 
and this is what was documented. The heart was severely enlarged and there was significant scarring around the pulmonary veins, making visualization difficult. All around the, her tissues were fragile and the right atrium tore when placing the venous cannula. The right atrium was repaired with a plegated 4-0 proline suture. So is this unplanned related to unsuspected anatomy or is this unplanned related to surgical complication or is this a planned right atrium repair or I don't know, please explain this again. And we've got the poll up there. People are still answering. We'll let that run for a little bit. I, Melinda, you got some um, very positive feedback in the Q&A. They really, re, um, really liked your um, bookmark feature review along with the other information in the training manual. So thank you. Oh, that's good. Okay, it looks like the poll is pretty much, uh, oh, just when you thought it was done. I can't see the poll running, but here, let me see if I can uh, do some curious to you. see. Can you see it now? Uh -oh. Okay. All right. Well, I see it now. Yes. Okay. So it looks like. I guess people are done answering. I'm, I'm going to end it. Majority of the people got the question right. This is a right atrium repair unplanned related to a surgical complication. They tore. The, they tore this right atrium when they were cannulating it. That is a surgical complication. That's not supposed to happen. We're not supposed to tear the atrium while we're cannulating the patient. So that's a surgical complication. Okay, the next question. Um, I'm looking for a little assistance on how to code a TAV or turned open heart surgery. The valve was successfully deployed in the cath lab, but the wire lacerated the ventricle at the end of the case. The patient went to the OR for a left ventricular laceration repair utilizing cardiopulmonary bypass. So answer A, is this an LV repair unplanned related to unsuspected anatomy? Or is this an LV unplanned related to surgical complication? Or is this an LV repair planned? Or is this, hmm, I'm not sure about this. I'm just going to say this is a tricky one, Melinda. This is a tricky one. You got to think about this one. This is mm -hmm. a tricky one. And I can tell by the answers that it's a tricky one. Yeah. This is about, we're about split. We're a little. Okay. All right. Oh. Hold on. Give everybody a chance. Oh, yeah. it's, it's getting closer and closer. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to end it now. Okay, so the answer to this question is this is an LV repair planned. Okay, so let's go over why this is planned. So first of all, TAVRs are optional to enter into the STS database. And the LV repair is a required case to enter into the, into the database. So the LV repair is going to be your index procedure in this, in this case, whether you enter TAVRs in the database or not. This turned into a, a, an LV repair, which is a required procedure to be entered. So that's your index procedure. At that point, the TAVR becomes a prior CV intervention. Now, in the cath lab, when the left ventricle was lacerated, they called the surgeon in and the surgeon planned to take this patient to the operating room and fix the left ventricular um, laceration. So this was a planned procedure. It's not due to a surgical complication because again, the TAVR, first of all, is an optional case to enter. Second of all, it's, it's a transcatheter case. Um, and thirdly, it's, 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 it's not an index procedure. So it's not like it happened during an index required procedure that we needed to enter into the database. 
So the LV repair was the index procedure and it was planned. Tricky, Melinda. That was a tricky one, but I get those situations a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it was a good I one. Just distributed a lot of slides out about those situations. Um, it's the same thing as if the, the patient had the tavern then had to go to a saver. Again, the same concepts apply. That's the right. saver is required and it's a planned procedure. Okay, question number three. The patient came to the OR for a cabbage and the intraop TE showed a fibroelastoma tumor on the aortic valve leaflets. And the following was performed in addition to the cabbage. I used five scissors as well as 11 blade in order to shave off the fibroelastic tissue from the upper surface of the left leaflet of the aortic valve without injuring the leaflet. Um, the valve appeared to be intact at the conclusion. So is this a repair due to unsuspected anatomy, um, surgical complication, or is this a planned AV repair? Or no clue, help me. Oh, wow, overwhelmingly, everybody's getting this, pretty much getting this answer right, which is good. Okay. That looks like, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, 86% of the people, 87 now, gonna... say that this AV repair is unplanned related to unsuspected anatomy. And it is, that's, that's the correct answer because the surgeon didn't know um, that um, this patient had it. He just found it on the TEE and had to take it off. So this is a good one for unsuspected anatomy or disease. I think we have a couple more. Okay, next question. Patient with multivessel disease was transferred to our hospital after diagnostic cath. The surgical consult was obtained, but the patient was a poor surgical candidate. After further discussion, the patient opted for a high-risk stenting. The PCI intervention resulted in perforation of the LAD. Whoops. Emergent call to CD, CV surgery was placed. The surgeon consented for mediastinal expiration or bleeding possible emergent cab. Cabbage was performed. So is this cabbage unplanned due to unsuspected anatomy? unplanned related to surgical complication or planned good case melinda yeah well this one just came in through the mailbox the couple days ago i can't remember yeah. who sent it in but it provided me with a very good scenario for this discussion mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good one and it's relevant it happens and it happens a lot on friday night, looks, friday afternoon look, looks like most people are getting the right answer which is great okay hold on all right, I'm going to end it. Okay, so 87% of the people said this was a cabbage planned, which it is because this patient was in the cath lab and he was having a PCI when the LAD was perforated. Surgery come, was called. Surgeon said, oh gosh, I've got to take this patient. I'm going to explore him and I'm probably going to have to do a cabbage on him. So this is a planned, this, when the surgeon took this patient into the OR in his mind, he was going to fix that bleed and maybe and possibly do a catch if that vessel needed it, which is what he did. So this is a planned procedure. It's not a surgical complication because it didn't happen during surgery. A PCI is not considered surgery. It's an interventional procedure. Now this, your reason for going to the OR emergently is probably an angiographic accident because that's what this is oops, I didn't mean to perforate that LAD in the cath lab. Okay, next question. That's it. Oh, that was it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wish we had more. I love those scenarios. <laughs> I love them so much. Okay, so the resource, uh, doc, thanks, Melinda. That was really great. You're welcome. We have, a, we have some other questions um, that will be coming your way shortly, so don't worry, you're not done. Uh, STS resources, and then... Uh, if you need me, see crone at sts.org and database operation questions is stsdb at sts.org. And now we're going to go over to the questions. All right, Melinda, this one's going to come, this one's for you, for Jennifer. Uh, my, uh, anesthesia, my anesthesia team uses 15 minute windows with their documentation for medications instead of an exact time. If they chart a pre op beta blocker, given between 9 and 9.15 and an incision time at 9.05, would this count as having a pre-op beta blocker or would they need to chart it between the 8.45 and 9 o'clock window? 
Well, there's a couple things wrong with this, first of all. So your beta blocker has to be within 24 hours. So you have to know the exact time that it was given. So a little block that says 0900 and 0915 is not really a good way to document that. Um, because you don't know if it was given at 0900 or 0915 or 0910 or 095. You don't have any way of knowing that. So I think you're going to have to work with your anesthesia providers to um, document this in a, in a fashion that is um, clear so that you know what time this beta blocker was given. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that. I think you should have an exact time on medications given. Um, especially, well, especially one that's that important is the MQF yeah. measure. Yep, I agree. We need to have that. Okay. Um, is there a way to capture if CHF is a new diagnosis or is acute new and chronic ongoing? Well, there is. I mean, under sequence of 9-11, I believe, in the training manual, um, it asks about heart failure, and it also asks if it's acute or acute on chronic, I um, can't remember the exact terminology, but 9-11, sequence 9-11. Um, Yeah, so heart failure, yes or no. And then you've got your timing there, whether this is acute heart failure or chronic or both. It could be acute on chronic. And then the in 913, it asks you about the type of heart failure that you have also. And I just want to pull up our definitions on acute and what chronic means. Acute is within two weeks. Yep. So it would be, you would code the new one, new patients as acute, but the chronic patients are um, or without an acute, is something that has been longer than the two weeks, no acute exacerbation. Within two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, next question. If a patient is admitted with infection of sternal site, of sternal surgical site, and there is no mention of deep tissue, do I code simply as superficial? This patient was a transfer in the discharge summary from their readmission site states only sternal infection treated with IP and OP antibiotics. IV. Um, you know. I suspect this is a superficial infection, especially since they didn't open the patient up. Um, and they just treated him with some antibiotics. But you can you can always go to sequence um, 6690 in the training manual. And it will give you the criteria. Just scroll down a little bit further. You have the criteria for the superficial sternal infection. And then if you scroll farther down, you have the criteria for the deep sternal wound infection. But my, my suspicion is this, since this treatment was not invasive, it's probably a superficial infection. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Melinda. COVID test results as presumptive positive. Positive. Does that mean yes, positive to COVID? I'm not sure if that means yes or if that means no, honestly. Um, I think I would um, discuss that with your uh, lab personnel. What, any thoughts, Carol? Yeah, I agree. I mean, their test results, they should be either positive or, or negative. I'm not sure. If it's just that they didn't have a strong enough result to, to deem that as a positive result, I don't know that I would code that as positive. And remember that the testing needs to be, if you're looking at test results, they should be PCR test. Right. Is there a way to capture LV thrombus preoperatively? I did abstract the DOR under LV aneurysm and other cardiac. And no, there's no way to capture that preoperatively. Okay, question one on your, um, let's get back here. Question one, what about uh, just part of the surgery? 
Let me see. What does she mean? What about just part of the surgery? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Michelle. There's a mit the mitral valve was planned, but the right atrium repair um, was not planned because they had to do that. Um, because of a surgical complication. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, Michelle. Okay. Um, Tavra Abstractor would record this as, uh, would record this one as a complication. Is that correct? Yes. Well, yeah, that's true. If you, if you were just submitting this patient to the Tavra registry, the TBT registry, then this would be um, coded as a complication. But if, you, if you're a site where some sites enter TAVRs in the, they enter it in both registries, they enter it in the TAVR registry and they enter it into the STS registry. <clears throat> and then other sites just only, only enter TAVRs into the TAVR registry. Um, so if you're a site that, enters just into the TAVR registry, then you put the TAVR in the TAVR registry and you put the LV um, repair in the STS registry. If you're a site that enters the TAVRs and the LVs into the STS, in this particular scenario, the TAVR would not go in as your index procedure. It would be a prior CV intervention because it's not required to be entered into our registry and the LV repair, which is required to be entered into the STS registry would be the index procedure. Thanks, Melinda. This is a good one. I never thought, I don't, I don't know the answer to this one. This is a good one. If an embolized TAVR valve is removed from the aorta on bypass, does this case need to go into the STS, into the adult cardiac? I suspect it it would, but again, probably need to look at that. I suspect I'm, I'm I mean, this is an aorta procedure. I'm sure they're having to go in and move the remove this valve from the aorta. So I would, I would suspect this would go in. Yes. Yeah. Did they just retrieve it, or did was it open surgical? Yeah, I don't know. That's why I say it would have to be. Yeah. Have to look at this op note just to make sure. Yeah. Okay, patient smokes marijuana three times a week. It's not medical marijuana. Would this be cold, uh, code? Would you code this as current tobacco use? No, it's not coded as tobacco use. The only time marijuana is coded as tobacco use is if it's wrapped in tobacco leaves. Sometimes people smoke marijuana and they have it wrapped in tobacco leaves. And that's the only time that you would capture um, Met marijuana use as tobacco use if it's wrapped in the tobacco leaves. Thanks. Lots of positive feedbacks. So everybody loves the scenarios. Oh, let's see. What do we got here? Um, okay. Linda has a good one. Type B, not, not that not all of them are good. Type B dissection, which resulted in T-bar, deployed type 2 endo leak, had open... Um, T A T triple A days later had a is T triple A is and I'm sorry if this is a dumb question is does that just mean it's a thoracic or it's a, a thoracic triple A yeah okay days later had a ascending dissection and was repair was repaired by return to OR are the last two cases put in the database as new cases or reop and aortic dissection. All right, so but those are complications of the T-bar. Yeah, type B, the first procedure is the type B dissection with the T-bar. Mm -hmm. Patients they, still in the hospital, they develop an endo leak, had a, a AAA, then had an ascending dissection, return to OR, uh, repaired by return to OR. Yeah, those all sound like complications after the T-bar, unless, unless some part of that surgery was planned pre-op. I, I suspect this is all complication. Yeah, none of this sounds like it was planned. Yeah. Okay. 
Back to the fibroelastoma on the valve. Do we also code other cardiac for the tumor? Yes. So you would call, you would um, code the valve repair that you do plus the tumor in sequence. Um, I think it's 4150. Um, so when you have a, when you have a tumor, you can also code on a valve, you can code both. So Carol, if you pull up, I think it's 4150. We can show them that. I think that's the right. In the, on the data collection form of the training? Manual. Either place. Um, no. 4150. There we go. There's Maybe no. that's not the right number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pull, pull up the data collection form. It's under. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I can't always <laughs> remember. Melinda and I numbers. do this weekly. We have calls weekly and we play this game. Well, ah, we can't remember all the numbers all the time. Okay. It's under other cardiac procedure. Okay. Uh, section M. Look, it's going to be close. It's probably like 4250, right? Yeah, it's, it's going to be close. I know it is, but okay. So there it is. Cardiac. Tumor four one one five. Okay, well I was close. Two of the numbers. You were, you were so yes, you code your valve repair, and then you code um, the tumor over here in four one one five for the fibroelastoma. Okay. Thanks, Melinda. Um, what is the current STS version we should have at this time? We're on version four point oh two. Four point, oh my gosh. 4.2.2. 4.202. It's adult cardiac is designated the number four for our database. So we're four. The year of the upgrade was in 20. So 420. And this just happens to be version two of that uh, upgrade. And it uh, we never collected on version one. It was just there were errors found in the spec build that needed to be corrected and resulted in a version up, upgrade number. So it's 4.20.2. Four, uh, four <laughs> Check. Oh, we're funny, Melinda. Uh, Laurel and Hardy. Why is hemiarch a choice for aortic intervention, not also a choice for device placement? Hemiarch is a type of procedure. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah, I don't quite device placement. I'm assuming that I I don't know if we have a good picture here. Well, you can get the hemi arch and um I wonder if she's I wonder Leslie, is this like are you talking about fifty four fifty two down there? that section or I'm, I'm, I'm slightly confused. I think the hemiarch is a type of procedure, but it would be helpful, Leslie, if you could clear what, uh, which question or which uh, sequence number or variable you wanted us yeah, to. Yeah, that would be really helpful, Leslie. Just send it in to me. All right, Melinda, the ever uh, the never ending question of do we collect standalone LVADs insertions into the database? No, they're optional. They, they, they really need to go into Intermax registry. They, they're optional to go into the STS registry. Very good. Uh, next question. Pre-op beta blocker given. This is questions related to the pre-op beta blocker given mm -hmm. beta beta blocker given. I think we learned on a recent call that it will be accepted if the anesthesia report documents the beta blocker was given within 24 hours without the exact date or time of administration available. Well, that's true given certain situations. If you'll go to sequence 1030 um, in the training manual. Um, 1030, there you go. If you scroll down a little bit. There's some FAQs here um, that pertain to this. So, and with very specific uh, situations, Heidi. So the first one is the patient's on a chronic home beta blocker and the medication's listed on the pre-op H&P. 
medalist, but there's no time that it was given. Um, oh no, that's the wrong one. Never mind. God, what am I doing? I'm losing my mind. It's, a, it's November. There it is. I have an elective patient who is on a beta blocker at home. There's no med recon done the morning of surgery. If the surgeon or the anesthesiologist document beta blocker taken within 24 hours incisions, can I use this? And here's the answer. So it has very specific criteria. For an elective patient on a home beta blocker with no mention of re no medication reconciliation done, who has surgeon or anesthesia documentation that a beta blocker was taken within 24 hours of its incision, you can code yes. Since Here's a big one. You have no other documentation of pre-op beta blocker and there's no conflicts in the medical record to indicate that this is not true. So there's a qualifier for that. So, and you need to meet these qualifiers. This is the only documentation that you have. You've got nothing that contraindicates that this is not true and the patient is on one at home already. And I so, would add that this is much different than the case where the patient receives the beta blocker sometime between 9 and 9 15 it but is. surgery start time was also within that same time frame and we can't tell if that beta blocker was given pre-incision right so you know so this has very yeah this has very specific criteria mm -hmm. um, good okay uh, patient went to or for planned avr for av vegetation Intraop, the AV lesion appeared more like a myxoma than infective vegetation. Other than mild thickening of, of edge of non-coronary cusp, AV normal and able to be successfully debrided. For AV repair, uh, for AV repair rather than AVR, pathology came back as fibroblastoma. So planned AV, unplanned tumor resection uh, related to unsuspected disease or anatomy. Question mark? No, I think they're both planned because they went to the OR for an AVR for AV vegetation. So they knew something was on that valve. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know what it was. So in my mind, that that would be planned. They went in there expecting to get something off of that, a, that valve. I agree. I agree with you, Melinda. It's a, it's a planned AV repair. Yeah. <laughs> Um, are COVID-19 patients excluded from the data? Starting with January 1st, 2022, the COVID positive patients are no longer being excluded. Uh, in this last harvest, which included OR dates through December 31st of 2021, those patients will be excluded. Uh, just feedback, really appreciate the IQVIA education through the last seminar and, and any and all education is very appreciative. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, the, I think you covered this one. The LV repair would be other cardiac, correct? Yeah, but there's a, yeah, but I could say more on that. So let's go to sequence 4135. Because I think this is, the LV repair was a surgical complication. So I want to, I want to point this out. Not that one. Keep going. I'll tell you which one it is. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, there we go. Slide down. Okay, so bullet point number two, and this is real important. This one. So, Michelle, you're right. This unplanned LV repair due to surgical complication would be coded other cardiac, but there's a qualifier. For other cardiac procedures that are unplanned due to surgical complication, to sequence 2140 as unplanned due to surgical complication. This will open section M. Uh, and if the other procedure that was performed is not listed as an option in section M, do not code this as other cardiac other sequence 4135. Answer no to all the choices. And the reason we do this is for sequence 4135. It does not matter if it was for surgical complication or not. If other cardiac other sequence 4135 is marked as no or missing, 
it will stay in the isolated category. If you mark it as yes, it will fall out of the isolated category. And the STS wants the procedure to stay in the isolated category since it was a surgical complication. That's right. So that is a little qualifier. And I send this answer out to people all the time when they, they ask me about questions. How do I code this? So if it's unplanned due to surgical complication and you want to code sequence 4135, don't do it. <laughs> Just code no to all of them. Code 2140 and then say unplanned due to surgical complication and then go to section M and answer no to all the choices there. If it's Thank you. Due to surgical complication. Okay. Uh, um, do I capture vaping as smoking? Yes, I believe we do that here now. 4,400, sequence 400. Um, I think How do we you remember these, Melinda? How do you know these so quickly? Because I answer these questions all the time. What, what, what's the number? 400. 400. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I answer so many questions. They're, it's ingrained in my brain. Uh, <laughs> So there it is. And it does include, yeah, it includes vape, everyday smoker slash vape. There it is. Okay. Uh, we do not capture any type of marijuana unless it is specifically states the marijuana is wrapped in tobacco leaves. Yes, that is correct. correct. Marijuana is not an illicit drug in many, many states and more every day. So we don't capture that as an illicit drug. Okay. M Melinda, what browser do you use when you're working at, when you have your training manual open? Um, I just have it like an edge or Google, okay. either, either one of them. Okay. I'm in Chrome and my bookmarks, uh, somebody's asking to show the bookmarks again. My bookmarks are uh, over here, this yep. menu button. And it's this one here. I know it's, that's hard to see, but um, it's not as big as uh, not as big as Melinda's screen, but they're all here. So it was just this menu button in this. Okay. okay. Reading Linda's T-bar complication question: Does it matter if the T-bar was done by a vascular or a CT surgeon? Or oh, oh yeah, <laughs> it does, Annette, because a T-bar done by a vascular surgeon only who's not on the participant agreement does not go in our database. Okay. So yes, it matters. Um, it, but most often I, I hardly ever, ever see a T-bar just done by a vascular surgeon. And if your CT surgeon participates in the T-bar with the vascular surgeon, then it is required entry. So most often they do go in, but every once in a while you'll see a T-bar that's just a vascular surgeon. Okay, uh, Cheryl, this question is a little confusing. It says, a, a balloon pump was placed pre-op on my patient who had a cabbage. Do I abstract anything on the VAD explant? So, um, the, so well, after, uh, oh, the balloon pump was taken out after OR, but before DC. So a, a balloon pump is not, a, is not um, captured the same as a ventricular assist device. Yeah, Cheryl, why don't you send me this question? I mean, did the patient have a VAT in too? Or are you thinking that that the balloon pump's captured as a VAT? Or just, so just send this into the to the mailbox and we can work this out. Good. Thanks, Melinda. ECMO standalone without cabbage, does it need to be entered? You can enter them if you want, but you do not need to enter those into the database. Right. Uh, Leslie's question was on 5450. And the AS, what I thought it was, aortic devices. So she wants a choice for a hemi arch here, which so I'm not sure it's, we it's can. It's going to be either zone yeah. one, two. It's going right. to be within one of these zones. So hemi arch is a type of procedure. It's not an anatomical location. Yeah. That's what I thought she was asking about. So thanks for clarifying that, Leslie. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Am I remembering correctly that if a patient has a PCI on a few different occasions or some other intervention more than once, you only need to list it once in the pre-op interventions? That's correct. So in sequence, um, I think it's six, six, five or eight, 
one of those prior prior CV interventions, we have a oh. note that you sorry everybody for the scrolling. Uh, if you um you know have multiple cardioversions or multiple this or multiple that, you only need to list it one time. You don't have to list the 15 cardioversions they've had before. Same thing with previous PCI. Yeah. Okay. And for if a patient did not have any cabbage done, but had a new valve repair done, no medical history needing a beta blocker, do we put contraindicated for the beta blocker or put no? You're, you can put no, Grace, because the beta blocker metric is only for isolated cabbage patients. So if the patient is just having a valve procedure, you don't need to meet the requirements for the pre-op beta blocker or the discharge meds. Mm -hmm. That's right. Those are just for isolated cabbages. That's right. Uh, when we access the STS national database and go to the ACS standard version 4.2, it gives us the option of training manual and then FAQ. That's correct. Oh. So it's the four point. Oh, I think maybe we should explain the difference between the two. Is that what? So every month the training manual is updated. So that's the first link, the training manual. It takes you to this manual we've been looking at. The, the summary underneath that is, is a, a summary of all the things that I updated in March. So you, it's a quick re reference and then it's a running total. So you can see that you run into February, what was updated in February and then what was updated in January and it just continues going on. So this is just a quick reference to um, I see wanna, I think what was updated in the training manual. Also bookmark them too. So however you choose to use it. Um, and I think it's important to note. So when we talk about version, we have, um, you know, the database as a whole is updated every so often, every three or every three or so years. The training manual is updated monthly, and those are with the new FAQs that Melinda might get in that will help clarify things that for, for data abstraction of this current version. Um, when you're abstracting, it's important that you use the most recent version, the version that aligns with the OR date. So you, um, and you could use the most recent version, this one that's posted in March, because it includes all the updates back to the beginning of when version 4.20 went live, which was July 1st of 2020. So uh, as Melinda has underlined here, do not use the old training manuals or other data definitions. Always refer to this, the current training manual that's posted and use that training manual to reference um, the definitions, the intent clarifications, and any FAQs that were added for uh, additional clarification. Anything to add there? Uh, no, I was just reading ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Um, and I don't know. So I'm using a. I'm using a. I'm using a Apple. Melinda, what kind of computer do you? HP. Do you I have an HP. Yeah, Melinda has a PC. So but it's it a lap. Mine's a laptop. Yeah, laptop. and it might be the um, the reason why the training manuals might look different. It might be the browser that you're using to open it. So I think I'm using Edge, and I think Melinda's using uh, Edge Edge too. So it's mm -hmm. probably why you might want to try Edge. But bookmarks are available in all the. It should be available in the different browsers. We uh, our marketing team is usually pretty good about making sure that those are available. Okay. I think you just showed the menu, but not the bookmarking trick. I could be wrong. So the bookmarks are over here on the left. Yeah, you right. just click on them and it'll take you. Yeah. So it has the sections. It has introduction, administration, hospitalization. And then if there was the new FAQ added for, if there's an update added for March, it's going to be listed underneath the section. So this is an update that Melinda added in March that falls underneath the risk model section, risk factor section. Okay.
No VADIN, but I get an error on my missing Vero report as VAD explant next, not charted. Just skip I, over that one. Actually, I just put an FA, I just updated the training manual for that. So you have to answer no to that question or you're going, it's going to show missing. So, and I just put that in the training manual for March because I kept getting so many questions about it. So it's, it's in the training manual. Um, it's under sequence. I don't know. Go to the center. Here it is. So keep going down. Keep this going one, down. right? Uh, nope. Keep going down. It's the next one. Um, fad explant. Where is it? You have to put no. You have to put no. Um, I think it's 3875. Okay. You have to answer no to that or it's going to show up missing. All right. A few more minutes, Melinda, if you can spare. A few more minutes, yeah. Okay, so if TVAR was done by the vascular surgeon only and the complications occurred and the CT surgeons performed the corrective surgery, then the, the CT surgery would be an index procedure, not a complication, correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, she's asking about VAD because if you have a, a mechanical assist device and you don't answer no for VAD explant, then VAD explant shows up as missing. Yeah, I thank you, Susan. Correct. I think Melinda just covered that one. Thank you. Correct. Can you go through an arch replacement versus a hemi arch in a future webinar? We can. Yeah, that's a good idea. And um, we can see if we can get Dr. Kim to help us with that. Yeah, or Nancy Honeycutt to help us with that. Perfect. Mm. Uh, I think this question had been asked, but I had a bad connection earlier. Okay. For public reporting refresh, is it only the most recent harvest report that will be publicly displayed or will it show the previous one year star ratings as well? And I think Sydney dropped off. Um, I'm going to say it's the most recent one, but I, I am going, Glace, I'm going to refer you back to Sydney Clinton um, just so that she's able to uh, provide you with the most definite, accurate information. So I'll put her email in the chat box for you. Will we get the report ending 1231 before it is publicly reported? Yes, you'll receive your you'll receive your Harvest One reports before we refresh the public reporting page. Uh, aren't you supposed to use the training manual for version for the month of the index procedure? Abstracting February cases, use the February training manual. Correct. So, uh, well, no, so all of the, not no, but all of the updates are in the current training manual. So all of the, if you're abstracting a February case, the February updates are going to be in uh, the March training manual, right? Because it lives on. Well, yeah, the February will be in there. But what she's asking is, like, if you, I think this is what Stacey's asking. If the March training manual's out and you're using, you're abstracting January cases, you should really be using the January training manual or just the January updates because that's what you'll be audited on. So yeah, the January updates, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't save all of the training manuals that are posted and no, but you can those. tell when things were updated. So, um, well, one way, right. Is the, well, you can you look at this and you can see things. It's also in the training manual. It's pretty clear when things were, uh, if they were updated, when they were updated, like here's, January 2021. So you can see as you're going through things when, if we've updated something, there is always a date when it was updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good one. Like say that you're abstracting a case, This just say this was a year ago and you're abstracting a December case in January. So you have an OR date of you know 12, 15 and you're going through and you see that there is an FAQ from November. So this FAQ is going to apply to that case because um, the case occurred after this FAQ was put into the training manual. But this January FAQ is not going to apply to that December case because it was in the training manual after. So the FAQs, um, you're going to look at the FAQ month and does that, does that help? Well, yeah, and that's how they'll be audited because the auditors are going to look 
when the auditors are looking at the audit fields, they're going to be looking at the training manual documentation or information that was available at the time of that procedure. Yeah, so to clarify on Stacy's question, to make that a statement, I would say that if you're abstracting February cases, 2022 cases, you use the training manual updates from February and before. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, and then Lisa says, Danette, you have to click on the hamburger. Okay, and then FAQs don't always change things. That's correct. So some are just clarifications. Uh, so if you already understood correctly, the new ones might apply. Well, that's true. If it was just a, if you already, it was already an understanding and it, it just, you know, historically we've always done it this way, but it was never written down um, kind of thing, I guess. I guess that's what Beth's talking about. Because I've tried as, a lot of these training manual updates come because of lack of clarity. Um, and I realize that it's not clear when I get questions about the lack of clarity. And so that's why we update the training manuals to, to clarify things and make it clear for people so that they understand better. Yeah, I agree with that. I wonder what's the best way, Melinda? So say that you're, you're, abstracting and you don't really have time every every time you're abstracting a field you don't have time to go through each field in the training manual to um to always notice if there's an addition or update what what do you think is the best way that data managers can be aware of or how can, what's the best way that they can utilize the training manual to make sure that they don't miss anything without um, spending too much time reading all the definitions every month? I think the FAQ summary that comes out is probably the number one thing. So look to see what's new, glance at it, um, familiarize yourself with the new stuff, and then if you come across something that you've never heard of or you're not familiar with, I would search the training manual to see if that terminology or that word or that procedure happens to be in there. You might be surprised. It's probably already been addressed. You just don't know it's there. Um, but I think this summary is probably the best way to, keep yourself updated and the easiest way because it's right there. Everything that's new is added right there. <clears throat> I think that's the yeah. easiest way to do it. Yeah. And I agree with Audrey to, for, I agree with you and Audrey both saying the same thing to review the FAQ summary every month and Annie saying the same thing. She reviews it every month. Um, and then she finished December uh, and before she starts January, she looks at the FAQ just to keep it in mind. So as she's moving for, as she's moving forward, I think that those are great ideas. Thanks, uh, Audrey and Annie. And uh, thanks, Melinda, for sharing that. I agree. I think the FAQ summary is, is the key. Okay. Well, I guess we're, we're it. We're done. For clarification, if a vascular surgeon... Just when we thought we were done. Hold on, Melinda. For <laughs> clarification, if a vascular surgeon is primary surgeon on a T-bar, but a CT surgeon assists, the case goes into the ACSD. That's correct. If that CV surgeon is participating in the procedure, then um, it will go into the STS and the CV surgeon will be listed as the surgeon because he's the participating surgeon. Um, if the vascular surgeon is not a participating surgeon. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thanks every, thank you, Melinda. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, really appreciate it. Oh, and I want to give a big shout out to the Michigan collaborative for another amazing data manager meeting today. It was uh, very good and uh, kudos to Dave and uh, Annie and Sherry and Melissa Clark for another great, uh, another great meeting for the Michigan group. So 
Thanks everybody again for joining. I hope you have a great rest of the day. And thanks, Melinda. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, my STS, STS family. I'll talk to you all later. Have a great day. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, Melinda.